Good morning again. What does Independence Day look like? What does it look like for you? When I was a kid growing up, it looked a lot different than it, it does now. We always used to have a huge uh, thing at my house. My parents uh, would have a lot of our family members over. We would always set up the volleyball net. We would have this huge family volleyball game, and I just have memories of my grandpa out there, and he was one of the best. Uh, playing volleyball with us, and we would uh, can grill uh, and have a lot of fireworks. Different people brought different fireworks. Uh, we were not as careful as we should have been with fireworks. Um, uh, we used to have the Roman candles, and we would not point them high enough um, where there were no people. Uh, but uh, fireworks were amazing. Uh, and as we've grown up, you know, we do fireworks. Sometimes we had a, we've had fireworks, good fireworks at her parents' house, and uh, we don't really have as big a Fourth of July as we did with my family. But as I got older uh, in high school, we didn't do that nearly as much either. And a lot of people's uh, Fourth of Julys, a lot of people's Independence Days look different. But when you ask the question, "What does Independence Day look like?" it's kind of a tricky question because the the, the bigger question is where. America is not the only place that has an Independence Day. There are multiple places throughout the world that celebrate a day of independence in their country, and it looks different than ours. In India, for example, when they celebrate their independence, they don't shoot fireworks into the sky. They fly kites on their Independence Day. Uh, it's probably, probably less dangerous. I don't know how, much, how many dangerous things we could have done with kites. We probably would have figured it out uh, as kids. But uh, uh, kites uh, is what they do in India. In South Korea... Uh, on an Independence Day, there are always government pardons, which represents the sweetness of freedom and liberty. Uh, in uh, Indonesia, they have a game where they have trees positioned vertically and they're oiled up, uh, and men s stand on top of each other to get to the top of the trees to get goodies that are placed up at the top of the trees. So just different traditions throughout the world, but here's the truth is that freedom and independence, wherever they are found, are celebrated. <laughs> Because they're important. Where, wherever you see independence found amongst nations of the world, there are times where it's celebrated. And not only do we celebrate freedom, we will defend and we will protect it. Anything that seems to threaten it becomes a target of our disdain. <laughs> Michael Reed uh, ran his truck into the Ten Commandments monument uh, in Arkansas. Uh, and he was also the one who was arrested for trying to destroy the, the Ten Commandments monument in Oklahoma before that. He's not the only person that was not happy about the Arkansas Ten Commandments. The ACLU was going to file a lawsuit saying that it was uh, an improper and illegal expression of religion. So although they would go about it in different ways, they would have those taken down. And a lot of that is epitomized by the very word that Michael Reed yelled as he plunged his truck into the commandments. Freedom. So Michael Reed... Uh, wanted to tear the Ten Commandments down in the name of freedom. But he's not the only one to, quote, tear down the Word of God over the issue of freedom. Uh, many of us, we want to pull down the Word of God in our own lives over the issue of personal freedom. One of the major objections to the Christian faith is that its moral restraints are too restrictive of our personal freedoms. That they stifle creativity, they stifle growth, and that they are an enemy of multiculturalism. They force all cultures into this specific mold. And, and a lot of times people have in mind specifically a westernized version of Christianity that is a western-minded religion that wants to westernize the rest of the world and force it into that Christian culture. And so are the moral, well, the moral restraints of Christianity, are they too restrictive? Do they keep us from our personal freedoms? I want you to look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Peter writing, saying, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Right out the gate. He's laid down some restrictions on their personal freedom. Verse 11 says, abstain from those passions. Verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day of visitation. Verse 13, be subject. That's not a nice word in our culture. Subjection. 
to someone or something else. Verse 13 says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it is to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free. You like that word? You like that word? So how is Peter mingling these two here? Live as people who are free, but not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So does the, do the Bible's moral restraints restrict our personal freedom? Yes. Yes, they do. They absolutely do. And Peter says that at the get-go. It definitely is going to restrict some of your personal freedom to abstain from these things. But look at verse 3 of chapter 2. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. The verse before that, Peter put some restrictions on their personal freedoms there. So put away all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up to salvation. In other words, there's a standard of living that you need to adhere to. For if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Tasted is a way of talking about something that you have experienced. All right? If you have tasted that the Lord is good. In other words, yes, there are restrictions on your personal freedom. And we submit to those because the Lord who loves us and gives those restrictions to us is good. So Peter says, live as people who are free. You, you are free. You have this freedom from sin in Christ. You have this freedom and liberty that God has given you as his people to live freely within his will, uh, free from the restraints of the Old Testament law that were placed there to teach us our need for a Savior and bring us to the grace and salvation of Christ. So there are freedoms which you enjoy in Christ. But unless you think that because I'm free in Christ, I can just do whatever I want and then just fall back on grace. This is one of the reasons Mahatma Gandhi said that the grace was an irresponsible doctrine. He said it would lead people to think they just do whatever they want and then go ask for forgiveness. Of course God will forgive us, and of course we have freedoms in Christ. But Peter and Paul as well in his writings say specifically, don't think that your freedom is a license to sin. It's not, not the case. That's not the way the doctrine of grace works. So I, I, I think there's some need for explaining how this balance works here. How, how is it not a stifling of my personal freedom and growth? Because I, I want to uh, do some of these things, but the Bible is pretty restrictive of a lot of these things. So Peter seems to think there's a balance here. Peter seems to think you can have both. So what is it here? I definitely recommend to you uh, some very good things, uh, in, and I recommended this book at the beginning, but it's a book called by Timothy Keller called The Reason for God. Uh, and if you haven't read it or, or you're uh, interested in some of these, he's very good uh, at going through a lot of these issues, and he goes even further than will go with some of this stuff. But uh, again, Timothy Keller, The Reason for God. I think you'll enjoy it um, if these are questions that you've had. Uh, Charlene is a lady that would not agree with Peter. She was a woman counseled by M. Scott Peck, who said of Christianity, quote, there's no room for me in that. That would be my death. I don't want to live for God. I will not. I want to live for my own sake because she believed that Christianity would stifle her creativity and growth. So did the 20th century social activist Emma Goldman. She called Christianity, quote, the leveler of the human race, the breaker of man's will to dare and to do, an iron net, a straitjacket, which does not let him expand or grow. At the end of the movie, I, Robot, the robot, Sonny, has fulfilled all of his objectives. And now he doesn't know what to do. And he tells Detective Spooner, one of the main characters of the movie, I don't know what to do now. And Spooner's response is, I guess you'll have to find your way like the rest of us, Sonny. That's what it means to be free. In this view, freedom is that we don't have any overarching purpose that is specific for all of us. Otherwise, if we did, if we were created for some specific purpose that was true of all of us regardless then we would be obligated to adhere to that purpose or pursue that purpose as the greatest good for which we were created. But since there isn't, then true freedom is the freedom to create your own meaning and purpose. That's what it means to be free in that, uh, in that thinking. The philosopher Immanuel Kant believed that. He believed that man's greatest good was to pursue their own thinking rather than tradition or authority. 
That resistance to an absolute moral authority is something that runs deep within our culture. In fact, it's almost a, a considered a necessity to being fully human to be able to determine your own moral standard. If you can't determine your own moral standard, if you must conform to some other moral standard, even if that fringes upon what you might want to do, it's almost like you're being robbed of your humanity uh, in our culture. But is it true that freedom is the absence of restraint? That oversimplifies freedom. It just does. First of all, this country has a lot of freedoms. We would consider, we call this a free country. In fact, if you tell somebody something they don't want to do, you may hear them say that. Free country. Uh, you know, I mean, we throw that around. Like, this is a free country. We have freedoms. But that doesn't mean you're free to do whatever you want. That's why we have prisons. We have jails because freedom doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. The, our definition as humans of having freedom, appropriate freedom, is not the absence of constraint. In fact, the person who says that you should not infringe upon their freedoms is in that moment infringing upon yours by telling you not to do that. They are stopping you from doing something you want to do and telling you that you shouldn't restrain people's freedom. They're doing the thing they're asking you not to do. Only the animals live with a version of freedom that means absence of restraint or constraint altogether. Only the animals live with that. We don't actually believe that in real life. But it's bigger than that. In many cases, proper constraints are the path to the greatest liberation. Where are my musicians in here? Some musicians. It's okay. I know you're humble. You can raise your hands here. Yeah, uh, musicians, if you want to, yeah, there you go, there you go. If you want to be great at music, right? If you want to be a great piano player, if you want to be a great guitarist, if you want to be a great musician, then you have to put some restraints on yourself. You have to restrain your personal freedom in some areas, right? If you're going to give yourself to practice and practice and practice, when your friends go out and do something, else, maybe you need to practice. Or you want to go watch TV, but you want to be, you want to be good. So you put some restraints on your freedom to do some other things in order to be great at this thing. But what does that do for you? It liberates you to being able to do things that you could not do otherwise. You are now liberated to be able to do great things on the piano nobody else can do. Right? Or other people that didn't practice can't do. You unlock and liberate yourself to being able to do some things because you restrained yourself the freedom to do other things. Okay, so we discover that that is true in every area of life, where if you want to be free to do some things, you have to restrain yourself in other areas in order to accomplish that. Now, what, what has to happen is it has to be a part of what is actually true of your capacity and reality. If you want to liberate a fish to the ability to breathe without being in the water and survive on dry land, Throwing it out there and restricting its freedom to swim in the water to liberate it to its ability to walk on land is not going to end well. It's not going to liberate it. It's not going to unlock its potential to do that. It's going to kill it because it's not within its ability. It doesn't honor the reality of what it means to be a fish. If I decide, you know what, I want to liberate myself of the freedoms of being an incredible NFL lineman. So I'm going to restrict some freedoms to go do other things I want so that I can practice and become a great NFL lineman. It doesn't honor the reality of my nature. Look at me. Okay? So it doesn't matter if I decide to restrict my freedoms in one area to liberate myself from the freedom of another if I don't honor my reality. Okay? Because it is not going to happen. But in the areas where we do have reality and potential, freedom is not the absence of restriction. It's finding the right ones. We know that we only grow intellectually, vocationally, physically through proper constraints of freedom and discipline in some areas to unlock our potential to perform well in other areas. So to say that for some reason the restriction of moral freedoms is going to stifle growth and be the leveler of humanity, growth never happens without restrictions. Ever. Growth in every area of life happens because you restrict freedoms in one area to discipline yourself in another one. So it's just not true that the absence of restraint is the only way that we can grow. We only grow through restraint in the right areas. So why would the same not be true for spiritual growth? Instead of insisting 
that moral freedom without constraint is the way we should go. Rather, we should discover the best source of truth concerning morality and spirituality. And then discipline ourselves to live up to that standard, knowing that it will liberate us to becoming the greatest version of ourselves. Well, what is it? What is the moral and spiritual reality that we should acknowledge and seek and thrive in it? This is where we can really build a bridge between the Christian teaching of reality and uh, a lot, many of those who want to throw off the moral restraints of Christianity. Because just about wherever you are in the world, regardless of specific belief systems, the majority of belief systems still uphold love as the supreme ethic. Even if you disagree on what love is, they still uphold love as a supreme ethic. That's the driving force in a secular uh, or a progressive uh, ideology about uh, human rights in any capacity right now. It, human rights is about you're not being loving, you're not being fair, you're not honoring the value in another human being. Love is the supreme ethic. Now, we may disagree that of, of what love looks like. I don't think it's loving to decide never to disagree with somebody. I, I think that's unloving. So, But love is still upheld as the supreme ethic. So, think about love. God upholds love as the supreme ethic. In fact, according to John, God is love. It's the very essence and nature of his being. So, it's the most liberating freedom loss of all, Keller says. Love, isn't it? The most liberating freedom loss of all? Does that even make sense? It does. One of the principles of love is that you lose some of your independence and right to make your own decisions about what you're going to do. When you fall in love with somebody, what do you do? You give up your independence in some ways, don't you? Do you, if you fall in love, you get married, and you decide that you are still going to be the master of every single thing that you do, and that other person's not going to have a say in your activities and behaviors, how well is that marriage going to go? It's not. Right? Part of love is self-sacrifice. It's saying, I give to you at cost to myself because I love you. I'm going to let you have a say in how I live and what we do together. That's, that's part of what it is. That's what love is. At the core of love, it is self-sacrificial. You lose some of your personal freedoms, but then you are free to experience the blessings of love. You can't enter a deep relationship and still make decisions just based on what you personally want to do all the time. But that confronts us with the complexity of the concept of freedom. Human beings are most free and alive in our deep, intimate relationships of love. But healthy, loving relationships involve mutual, unselfish service, a loss, a mutual loss of some personal independence and freedom. So both sides must say to the other, I will adjust to you. I will assert, I will serve you even though it means sacrifice for me. So then at first, a relationship with God would seem inherently dehumanizing because it doesn't seem like there's going to be a lot of adjustment both ways, right? I mean, he's an all-powerful, omnipotent, perfect God. I have to adjust to him. There's not going to be any adjusting in my, my direction. Aha, uh -huh. this is where Christianity makes the connection point, right? Because God has, in the most radical way, adjusted himself to us at cost to himself. Not his moral standards, those have not been adjusted, but in the incarnation. In a God who has become human and who washed the feet of his betrayers, who died on the cross for us, who said in the most radical way, I will adjust to you. A God who never had to know pain, who never had to know death, who never had to know suffering, came down here and adjusted his reality in the most uh, radical way and said, I love you. I want a relationship with you. So I will adjust some things in this way to honor self-sacrifice that love means. And I will give my life. For you, so that in this loving relationship, who has given more? Not me. Not me. So then, in this way, did Christ adjust some of his personal freedoms for me? <sighs> you think he wanted, in every sense, to suffer? To feel pain? Mm -mm. Hebrews 12 says, despising the cross. 
despising the shame, he endured the cross and sat down at the right hand of God. Yeah, he wanted to bring forgiveness to us, but he did not want to hurt. And so he puts aside some of his personal desires in the flesh in order to serve us in love. So at first sight, it seems like it would be a dehumanizing relationship, but Christianity says, no, 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 no. God loves us in the most radical way. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians 5.14 because this is precisely what Paul goes on to say. Here's why. Here's one of the reasons we say I'm fine with adjusting to what God asks me to in this relationship because he went first. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5.14. Paul says, for the love of Christ controls us or compels us. How does love control or compel? Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who has died for their sake and was raised. So Paul says, no, no longer live for ourselves. This is no longer about me. I will allow myself to be adjusted in my personal freedoms to what he desires in this relationship. Why? He went first. The love of Christ is what controls us, not the overburdening, oppressive, slave master behavior of God controls and constrains and puts limits on us. The love of Christ constrains us. For the Christian... When you, it's the same with Jesus as when you fall in love. You think that when you fall in love, and you, how long do you wait to decide to discover what that person likes in order that you might accomplish that thing? Not long. That's what love means, right? You want to figure every little thing about it. Not to the stalker level. Okay? Maybe. But sometimes the line between being madly in love and stalker gets a little blurred. Okay? Yeah. Now look. You decide what, what that person, you, you, you decide to figure out everything about them, and you meet that as sacrifice to yourself. And it's like that love controls you. It compels you. You're still under freedom of your will, but you are compelled by your love for that person to do what that person wants, even though it means sacrifice for you. And in doing so, you receive love back for them, from them. At least hopefully you do. In relationship with God, you always do. You receive it first. But then here's the thing. We say things like um, uh, that person's head over heels for her. Or she's got him wrapped around her finger. Right? And it seems as though you are in a relationship where it's servant to master. But inside, what does it feel like? Heaven. Right? You feel great. You're okay with that. Because you love them. And they love you. You're all right with the constraints of sacrifice in a loving relationship. For Christians, it's the same with Jesus. The love of Christ constrains us. Once you realize how much Jesus has changed for you and given himself for you, you are not afraid of giving up freedom in some areas in order to find truer freedom in him. Freedom is not the absence of constraint. It's finding the right ones, those that fit within our nature and liberate us. Well, we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, Paul says. We will thrive the most and be the most fulfilled and find our greatest liberation in him. You can use a can opener as a hammer, but it will never do anything as well as it opens cans. Why? That's what it's made to do. You can live your life for all kinds of purposes that are outside of God's will, but you will never do anything as well and thrive as well as you do within God's will for your life. Why? That's how you were made. That's who you are. And so if we want to find our greatest liberation, we find it in him. But wouldn't having to conform to a pattern like Christianity, wouldn't that force people from diverse cultures into a single mold? Wouldn't that be the enemy of multiculturalism? Actually, it's quite the opposite. In reality, one of the beauties of the Christian uh, faith is that all of the diverse cultures and diverse amounts of people working together under the common goals of Christianity, and yet in diversity is one of the parts of wisdom of the church that God wants the world to see. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 12. This is what Paul says. Lest they think there that everyone be the same, or that one person is better, and so everyone should look like that exact one person, or we should get rid of all of the diversity and go to the... No, no. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, 
Not 2 Corinthians 12, 12. That won't work out, guys. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slave or free, there's cultural and social diversity. Paul lists there. And all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The Bible celebrates diversity in unity. The Bible celebrates it. That's what is so amazing about the early church and the diverse cultures that it began to bring together from the get-go. You have It starts with the Jewish individuals, and it reaches out to the Gentiles, and then you have uh, Romans that are brought in. You have diversity that took place so much so that 1 Corinthians is trying to handle all of the issues that happened when these different cultures came together into one church. But he didn't conform them to one mold in the sense that he stripped them of their cultures. In fact, they had to find out a way, according to Acts 15, to be Christians and Gentiles. To be Christians and Jews. They had to express their faith as a Jew, as a Christian, and yet all expressing the same doctrines and truths and morality of the Christian faith. And so they had to work out their way of being a Christian within their own cultural backgrounds. The same thing is true today. If you go and you look at Christianity throughout the world in different cultures, sometimes it's confusing. But Todd knows he's been to Africa many times. I get uh, pictures from guys in India uh, and their church services, and if you didn't know it was a Christian church service, you might think it was a gathering of Hindus because that's what they look like. They're still, still dressed in these ways. They still practice. They, they, you, you can tell in their church service that they're practicing Christianity, but they, it wouldn't look exactly like ours. It will have cultural elements there that don't change the doctrines and the way that we worship, but it's going to look different. That's one of the beauties of Christianity is that it is not culturally restrictive. In fact, from the beginning, it was not so. Christianity was first dominated by Jews in Jerusalem. Then it entered the Mediterranean. Later, it was received by barbarians in Northern Europe. Then it became dominated by Western Europeans, then Northern Americans. Today, most people claiming Christianity in the world live in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. It's not a westernized religion trying to adapt all other cultures to itself. Just take Africa. There's an African scholar named Lamine Sene. He says Africans had had this long tradition of supernatural belief uh, and their superstitious beliefs in the good versus the evil spirits. So Christianity came in and plowed it all and got rid of all of their African heritage and all their African cultures and said nothing that you believe is true. Actually, that's not what happened. See, what Christianity did was come in and show them where Paul did in Acts 17. Paul came in and said, all these things that you worship, I notice, you're very spiritual. He complimented the right things and then turned them from the false things to the good things. But th this is what happened in Africa. Sine writes, people sensed in their hearts that Jesus did not mock their respect for the sacred, nor their clamor for an invisible Savior. Christianity helped Africans to become renewed Africans, not remade Europeans. Christianity reached down inside of them, and it, it made this connection between man and the supernatural that they were making in their superstitions by showing that God has not just spiritually or supernaturally done that, but he, did, he historically did it in Jesus Christ. He came down here and made a connection between us. And so it took their longings and deep-held beliefs and brought them to life in reality, historically, rather than in some of the superstitions. But so again, as Sine says, not remade Europeans, but renewed Africans. I think historian Andrew Walls hit the nail on the head. He said cultural diversity was built into the Christian faith. In Acts 15, which declared that the new Gentile Christians did not have to enter Jewish culture, the converts had to work out a Hellenistic way of being a Christian. So no one owns the Christian faith. There is no Christian culture. 
the way that there is an Islamic culture which you can recognize. Let's put together a puzzle as we close. Consider some few headlines, what, what they have in common. Corey Doty gave birth to a baby whose gender was left undesignated on all official records so the child can choose their own identity later in life. Meanwhile, early mooners is becoming a new wedding trend. That's where you go on your honeymoon before the wedding so you can relax from wedding stress. The Bible teaches that God made us male and female, places an emphasis on gender roles in the home, in the church, of male and female throughout Scripture. Homosexuality is condemned in the Old Testament and the New Testament, Romans 1, 1 Timothy 1, 1 Corinthians 6. And Jesus in Matthew 19 set forth the one man, one woman for life that came from the beginning, thus effectively ruling out other arrangements. The Bible also teaches against premarital sex in Hebrews 13, 4, 1 Corinthians 7, 2. Some more restraints that the Bible places on our activity. But imagine a culture where people lived according to the Bible's mandates on this. According to the CDC, not a religious organization, while homosexual men make up a very small percentage of the American population, they still comprise 67% of all new HIV diagnoses. Imagine a culture where sex was restricted to marriage. Not only would we have less to deal with in areas like obvious areas like STDs and then in emotional damage done by casual sex relationships, but in America, 85% of women who have abortions are unmarried. While there are many reasons for their abortions, this still means that more than 50 million babies aborted in America are conceived out of wedlock. Research also indicates that children of unmarried mothers are more likely to live in poverty, more likely to experience family instability, more likely to have problem behaviors, and more trouble finishing school. Now, can a person who finds himself in this situation, who wants to serve God and turn things around, can God help them with these things? You betcha. Will God's grace forgive them when they come to him? You betcha. But that doesn't take away the damages done by sin in our world. We still live with consequences. But imagine a world where we did live according to the moral restraints of Scripture. See, what this shows us is that contrary to conventional wisdom today, God's moral standards are not oppressive. They are an expression of love. He is a loving father who knows his children and wants what's best for his children, and he loves us too much just to let it go. When we're young, man, I want to go to school. I don't want to go to school. If our parents love us, what do they do? They accept us as we are with whatever we want. False. The answer is obvious. They want us to grow into all that we can be. And so they remain with the restrictions we don't always like because they know that that's how growth takes place. The paradox is this. If we make Jesus our Lord and choose to glorify him in all that we do, we will find greater happiness than sin or we ourselves could ever provide. As C.S. Lewis said, God cannot provide us with happiness apart from himself. There is no such thing. The opportunity available to everyone today is that God has reached out to us. And God loves us too much to just let us go in the state in which we are, even though that's going to be painful sometimes for us to adjust. I have a collarbone uh, here. I was telling Todd about this. Uh, I broke my collarbone in high school. There was this um, busload of children going off a cliff. And I'm like, okay, it wasn't that heroic. I broke it in a basketball game. I got tripped, okay? I tripped, and I fell, and I busted it. It healed like this. So instead of pulling it back and healing it, I was told that it would do that by itself. It did not. It healed like this. So sometimes it still gives me trouble, at least it, it would in the past. Uh, my arm might give out suddenly, or I might have some kind of pain in here. Um, and because of the misalignment, there's always going to be some kind of issue with it being broken like that. Now, how do we have to fix that? The only way to fix it now <laughs> is to break it and break it hard um, and then put it back together in that way. It would hurt. It would hurt bad. But we could get it fixed and put it back. If I don't, I can continue to live with it the way it is, but there are going to be some consequences I live with, right? It's never going to be exactly the same, exactly the way it could be. Now, this collarbone is not going to be that, it's not that big a deal, okay? I don't want you to feel bad for me. I'm not suffering. But with sin, it, it's not quite as small, right? The only way back is to break some things, some habits that I've put in place, some lifestyle things I've chosen that may have been there for a very long time. The longer they're there, the harder they are to break but once we do go through the pain of breaking them and God can place them back together, they can grow back stronger, 
and, and put us back where we need to be. We can continue to live the way we are, and we may live by, but we'll always live with those consequences. And in the end, we have separated ourselves from the great physician. And in the end, when we are separated completely from all that is good and all that is light, it is a world we do not want to be in. This morning, maybe you know the opportunity for God to help is there. Do you want that? It starts with submission to his will, Matthew 28, 19. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Excuse me, I'm quoting, <laughs> quoting Mark 16. Let's go with that one. It's good too. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not will be condemned. Jesus tells them in Matthew 28, 19, teaching them all things which I have commanded you. And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Or maybe it's the case that you need to resubmit to him. Or maybe you need encouragement. Maybe you're dealing with some things and you know that and you live with those consequences that won't go away, but you need God's help with that. Or maybe you simply need encouragement or prayers. If we can help you in any way, won't you let us know? All together we stand. To Canaan's land, I'm on my way.